We created a campaign in New York that it was very attention getting and uh, won a lot of awards. It was for a designer called Kenneth Cole, who at the time no one knew who, who he was because Kenneth was just a 25 year old kid starting out. But we created the, the ad campaign that essentially created the brand of Kenneth Cole that ultimately became an international iconic fashion brand. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by John Follis, who is the founder and creative of FollisInc.com. And we've just been having a wee bit of a chat and John reckons he's been in advertising since I was in primary school, but I don't believe that for a moment. But he has been running agencies since sort of 1989, where in New York he founded Follis and Verdi. And they work with some amazing brands like VW, Pizza Hut, Coke, you name it. And then in 2004, he was one of the first um, online consultancy agencies. And in 2006, I think it was his first um, marketing podcast, which would have been absolutely revolutionary yeah. at the time. So, uh, yeah. wow, what, a, what an amazing kind of background. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Deborah. Glad to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Oh, absolute pleasure. Hey, look, I'm, I'm really intrigued to find out more because, you know, you are the marketing therapy guy. You you help people with their marketing, their videos, their online stuff. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into what you do. Why did you, why advertising? Uh, that's a good question. I was undecided when I started my college uh, career um, or my, my courses I really, I was always good creatively. My mom was an art teacher, so artistically, I was very, very strong. But I didn't really know what career to go into until my second year of college. I took a graphic design course, and the instructor, about halfway through the course, pulled me aside, wanted to speak to me, which is usually not a good sign. And she asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, when I said I wasn't sure, she said, Well, can I give you some advice? She said, I really think you should pursue a career in something that's creative. And uh, this is not the school, right school for that. I would strongly encourage you to uh, find, go to a better school that has more of a variety of course curriculum, curriculums like um, marketing or advertising or architecture or fashion design or photography or any number of creative focused businesses that would allow you to um, really take advantage of your your talent. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I went, got into advertising, but it did not start out well because I transferred to one of the top advertising schools in the United States, Syracuse University. And um, my first advertising course, I did not get along with the instructor. And my, I, I had always done extremely well in any creative course, uh, certainly anything that involved art or design or creativity, which this course involved a lot of. And uh, my course, my grades started out as, as C's and kind of went, I don't know how your grading system is in New Zealand. We have A, B's and C's and D's and F's here. Yep, same here. <laughs> uh, and, and so I started out getting C's and go, I went downhill from there. And um, toward the end, with maybe uh, three weeks left to go in the class, the instructor pulled me aside. And unlike the first instructor who told me I was really, really talented at that other school, um, this instructor told me just the opposite. He said, I don't really think you have the talent for advertising, and I'm going to give you a choice. You could either accept the grade that I'm going to give you with three weeks to go, and you're not going to be happy about it. Or you could drop the class. Really? Which to me was not really a big choice. Um, I, I'm, I'm not someone who gives up easily. But when someone tells you that that's your choice, pretty much it's really not a choice. He's, he was going to flunk me. Mm -hmm. So rather than get an F, I decided to do uh, choice B, drop the class and get an incomplete. So I didn't have to tell my dad I flunked. The first advertising class at the very expensive college that he was paying tuition for and decided at that point that was that was a real um, come to Jesus moment because I was more than halfway through my college education, just decided on advertising as my career and basically told by someone in the business who was teaching. He was a New York guy who Syracuse is about five hours away from New York. So a lot of the instructors flew up to Syracuse to teach. Why they would do that, I don't know. 
But um, when someone tells you that, you know, with, with that kind of a professional background, you have to take it seriously. And uh, fortunately, Syracuse had a program where they had multiple instructors te teaching the same courses. So it permitted me the opportunity to try that course again because it was a required course that I had to do well in to proceed and take it with a different instructor, hoping that the result will be different. And fortunately, that proved to be the case. Different instructor, totally different experience. I think I got like an A minus in it with a different instructor. So that was a very important lesson for me to learn very early on. I say in my career, it was actually pre-career, but mm. in essence, it was, it was kind of the beginning of my career, realizing that a lot of um, success has to do with the personalities that you have to deal with. And, and I found that out pretty quickly thereafter when I started working in the business in New York and um, got fired four times in the first eight years of my career. Um, not because I wasn't talented, although at that time I didn't know that, um, but it had more to do with the dynamics and the, the office politics that I had to deal with that I was totally unprepared for. They didn't have a course in office politics in college. Mm -hmm. And two of the four times I got fired um, were situations where the guy who brought me into the agency who hired me decided to leave for a better job uh, within a few weeks after bringing me in, which is not necessarily a reason for me to get fired. But when the guy who wants you at that company is no longer at that company, it does make you vulnerable. And I don't know if you have the, the show Survivor in New Zealand. Yes, we do. do. You? Yep. Yes, we do. Um, but working um, in New York City in the advertising business, and I'm sure in many industries in many different cities, is a little bit like that show Survivor, mm -hmm. where um, you have to figure out who's on your, your side and who's not on your side, and you have to watch your back. And... Um, for any number of reasons, you you could get um, you could get blindsided, and you could you know you could get uh, voted off the island, shall we say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got voted uh, out of the agency uh, a few times, and you know two of those situations were for that reason. And but you know the the other thing I should say is that um, my personality uh, did not fit well with a corporate environment. And I didn't realize that the, the personality traits that uh, made me uh, be unsuccessful in that big agency corporate environment were exactly the same person, personality traits that made me hugely successful as an entrepreneur. And I, th I think that many of us can relate to that. Um, I know that I um, I actually got asked to leave school too, too when I was in my sort of late teens. They suggested there might be a better place for me, that um, I was very disruptive and maybe I should go and do something that was more suited to what I was doing. And I've been sacked a couple of times as well in my life. And at the time it feels awful, but it's probably the best thing that could ever happen because it, it opens you up to, yeah, that actually I was a square peg in a round hole. This is what I'm really designed for. But still, I mean, four times in eight years, that would, um, that would have an, an, an impact on your confidence so oh, you absolutely. Decide, yeah how did that work and then what how did you decide I mean, there, to go and do your own agency there were many late nights where i really began to reflect back on that college instructor who told me i sucked at advertising and shouldn't pursue it as a career <laughs> and started wondering if he wasn't right you know yeah. Um, but there's something called in New York called rent that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. And in New York City, it is not inexpensive. So that's that's that can be a pretty good motivating force to uh, get your ass out of bed and, and start to try to get yourself work. Yeah. And listen, there was a day where um, this is back in the day when uh, the Internet didn't exist. And uh, I went through the phone book. You know what a phone book is, right? Yes, yes, I, do. <laughs> yes. I think I'm a little bit older than you're assuming I am. We've had lots of phone books over the years. Yeah. Okay, well, for some of your younger people, a uh, phone book is where you, you, you have listings of companies you can call on the phone. And um, I, I, because I was running out of places, agencies where I could get an interview, I just decided that the best thing to do was to 
go through the phone book looking at ad agencies in New York, and there are many of them, and start with the A's and start making phone calls to try to get myself an interview. And I remember one particular day, um, I, um, I got uh, three interviews, but I had to call 106 agencies to get those. But it was one of those three interviews that actually, um, over the, the, the coming years, ended up being a, a turning point in my career uh, that enabled me to start doing some freelance work, which is what I pivoted to doing, freelancing for smaller agencies. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys that called me was one of these, these three people, these three agencies that I had gotten an interview with. Um, it took two years for him to get back to me. Uh, but uh, two years later, he called me back, uh, had a project to work on, and it was one of the projects that was incredibly successful. Um, we created a campaign in New York that uh, created a lot of buzz in New York. Everyone wanted to know who was doing this creative work because it was very attention getting mm -hmm. and uh, won a lot of awards. It was for a designer called Kenneth Cole who at the time no one knew who, who he was because Kenneth was just a 25-year-old kid starting out. But we created the, the ad campaign that essentially uh, created the brand of Kenneth Cole that ultimately became an international iconic fashion brand. And um, it also um, attracted a, a guy who turned out to be my business partner. He, he was really curious who was involved who was the, one of the creative people involved with this campaign. And he called me up and he was really eager to meet me. And uh, within um, a few weeks, we started working together. And within a few months, we won our first big piece of business that allowed us to um, basically put up a shingle as Follis and Verdi and call ourselves an ad agency. And within four years, we became one of the, the most successful and award-winning agencies in the U.S. Yep. Excellent. So tell, I've got, I'm really curious. Did you go back to the teacher at college at any time? Did I, did I what? Did, go back did to I, the teacher at college that told you you'd never be any good at advertising. Did I ever get back to him? I did see yeah. him at a, 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 a networking event. I think he was standing over the shrimp bowl and um, I was... I was tempted to go up and um, ask him if he remembered me, but I really didn't see the point. I mean, I'm not in, I'm not into gloating. Um, you know, if he remembered me, he would have seen my name in the press because we we got a lot of press uh, when we were um, when we were winning business and doing award winning work. So to me, that that was that was the satisfaction just being successful. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And in, in many ways, I, I I I'm very grateful to him because. You know, he forced me to really um, decide whether or not um, I, I, I wanted to pick myself up and um, continue pursuing that, uh, that path, mm -hmm. and uh, which was not an easy thing. But um, I, I think the, the, um, the, the, the value of success is is not so much what you've achieved but also what you've had to overcome to achieve it so um i i, I kind of take that as as a badge of honor that i was able to overcome being told by my first college advertising instructor that i sucked at advertising shouldn't pursue it as a career and then being told four times uh that i didn't um, wasn't good enough to work at that, their ad agency to then have my own ad agency and become one of the most successful in the country. Oh, that's fantastic. Great story. Hey, I'm, I'm just interested. What did you learn from your time in those larger advertising agencies that you then took into your own business when you started your own business? That uh, talent was a much smaller part of being successful uh, than I thought it sh would be and should be. Um, I, I, you know, in, uh, at Syracuse in the advertising program, they really, um, it was, like I said, one of the top in the country, and they really focused on being 
the the best advertiser that you know, I came up on the creative side. So the best uh, at the creative side of advertising, really being the best mm-hmm. and having the best advertising portfolio. And I thought that if I was the best creative person with the best adver- creative work, that I would be very successful. And it was kind of a hard pill to swallow to realize that that was a much smaller part of being successful in that big agency corporate environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what did that mean? And I also realized that when you're just starting out, it's like, you know, when you're a rookie, if you're on a sports team, you know, you really need good coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just be out of college, be on a football team or soccer. I don't know how it is in in soccer. We have football here. And, uh, you know, when you're a rookie, you may have been the best college player, but when you're in the pros, you really still, it's a whole different ball game and you still need a lot of coaching to be successful, to make it um, in the NFL, um, as it were. And so um, if you don't have someone in an agency um, who's got more experience than you, who wants you to be successful and wants to support you and en- enable you to um be successful, you're going to have a tough time. I don't care how talented you might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a whole different environment. You're really not prepared for that. Like I said, they don't have courses in office politics. So it, it really does require someone internally to help you, uh, to nurture you and help you to become successful. So when the guy, uh, when two of those situations, when the guy who hired me um, was no longer there to help me, um, that that certainly um, was one reason why I wasn't able to be successful, I think. Sure. And so how did you foster that kind of environment in your own agency as well? Because obviously, you know, you're award-winning, you're a successful agency. What did you need to do to, um, to create that environment? You mean for other people, for junior people? Yeah. Um, well, I... Um, enjoyed helping people. I mean, one of the things I did on the side when I was in New York was teach. I should teach night school at three of the top uh, universities in New York City. We have School of Visual Arts, we have Parsons School of Design, and we have FIT, uh, or Fashion Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, otherwise known as FIT. There are three of the top schools in the country. And I taught at all of them, and I enjoyed it. I, I like nurturing uh, people who are really um, had the passion for the business. You know, you have some students that don't give a shit and you have other students that uh, are really determined that really want to be good. So for those students, I I enjoy helping them as I enjoyed uh, helping people who were uh, more junior people at the agency that I I, uh, uh, had co-run, was the creative director of. So to me, that was, um, you know, if they if they did great work, that that helped us, that helped my agency. So there was no reason for me not to be supportive. In a big agency environment um, is, like I said, it's like Survivor. So you're dealing with people. They're they're not owners of the business. They see you as more of a as a um, competitor. Right. So if, if they have any way to like um, step on you to to to, you know, to 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 promote themselves or, or move themselves ahead, they will do that. It's a whole different dynamic at a big agency versus a small company. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Okay, so you so you went into your own agency. Um, you won the awards. You were doing very well. And then, um, if I'm really right, you then sort of did one of the first online consultancies. So you were really ahead of the eight ball in terms of where things were headed. Yeah, and I just want to mention because one of the the things you you ask your other guests is what what are the things you're most proud of, and one of yeah. the things that occurred when I when I was running my or co co running the agency is we had an opportunity to do some national public service TV commercials for uh, pr- the cause of child abuse prevention awareness and prevention. And they had uh, the commercials had a lot of media money behind them. This was uh, this was 30 years ago, yeah, about 25, 30 years ago. And it had five million dollars worth of TV media, which now would probably be twice that. Yes. Yep. Huge. And they ran during a, uh, a six week period. 
So to have what would in, in today's dollars, uh, 10, 10 million dollars worth of TV time over a six week period meant that they were seen by a lot of people. And apparently one of the people that saw those spots um, could have been the president of the United States, because a month after they ran, I got an invitation from the White House uh, to come to a special reception to be honored for the, the work that I did for this this particular nonprofit. And I wasn't the only one to be invited. I was one of, I, I think, maybe two dozen people from around the country who were doing uh, various, uh, involved with various nonprofit causes, but it was quite an unexpected uh, surprise and honor to receive a personal invitation to the White House uh, to a reception where I had a chance to meet the First Lady and get a photo op with the First Lady and, and you know, big knowledge for this work. So that was that was one of the things I was most proud of. And then what's interesting, Deborah, is six months later, I got kind of a similar invitation, this time uh, to the United Nations yep. for a, another public service ad, different ad, same cause, child abuse prevention. Um, somehow they saw the work and they uh, the letter said, uh, we'd like to uh, acknowledge your work by giving you uh, the first, this is the first time we're, we're doing this public, this United Nations Public Service Award, and we'd like to um, honor you with that award. So um, that, that was th those two experiences that happened the same year were probably two of the, the career experiences that I'm most proud of because it was for a really good cause. That's that's phenomenal. Well, well done. Congratulations. Yeah. So back to your question, I, I just wanted. Well, actually, to no, what, 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 what we're just going on that route. To, and what about personally? What's been your sort of most, um, you know, your most, the thing you're most proud of in your personal life? Well, you know, when you're running your business, it, it kind of does become your personal life in a way, you know, and, and the work, the the ad that that ended up doing, eventually allowing us to do this national. TV campaign was an ad that I came up on my own one night when I was sitting home on my couch eating potato chips watching TV and saw a documentary on Adolf Hitler that mentioned that he was an abused kid. Yeah. And when I saw this documentary that mentioned that fact, a light bulb went off over uh, off in my head. And I thought, gee, maybe I could come up with some kind of an ad that Reference the fact that Hitler was abused as a kid and turn that into a provocative ad for child abuse prevention. Mm -hmm. And so that 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 was my personal life. I was just home watching TV and I came up with the ad. So um, I, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. But um, like I said, you know, when I was running my my own agency, it, it, it was also very much my personal life. I could I was home, at home by myself watching TV and that's that was the the genesis of 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 this whole experience that ultimately got me honored at the White House and the U UN. Yeah, that's fabulous. Okay, so then back to my my other question that I asked. Then so um yeah, you're one of the first online agencies, right? It's one of the first online marketing. Consultants. Well, it was yeah, my first website. It wasn't. I won't. I don't know if I'd call it an online agency, but I I've discovered the the internet in 94 and in 96, I had my first agency website. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was pretty early on. There were a lot of big agencies in New York that I think still in 96 didn't have a website. So um, I kind of designed it and had a technical person do all the back end. I did the front end design and they did all the back end coding. And I was pretty proud of that. And um, I just for me, it was just another way for uh, as more and more, more people got online and um, used that to get information. It was another way for me to market my, my agency, promote it because all my work was there. So I was um, unlike a lot of my peers who were kind of um, um, confused by the Internet and didn't really think it was going to be something to pay attention to. I took a different attitude and said, um, I want to learn as much as I can about this, which, you know, carried on throughout my career. Um, you referenced the podcasting I got involved with. I started learning about podcasting and blogging uh, from the earliest days. I was reading about 
uh, or I was actually listening to podcasts in 2005. And after listening, listening to a few of them, I thought this would be a very cool thing to have. Let me, let me see if I can have my own podcast. So my marketing show with John Follis went live in February of 2006. Mm -hmm. And I continued it for about seven years. Wow. And I got into blogging about the same time. But a couple of years before that, and you referenced this um, in, in the introduction, um, in 2004, when uh, Skype was a new thing, oh, yeah. um, I, I, you know what Skype is, and I assume I your, yes. your listeners know what Skype is. I think it's still around. It doesn't seem to be quite as popular as Zoom no, I haven't seen anymore. it for a while. I think it got bought out by, um, did Microsoft buy it, I think? Could have been. Yeah, But uh, that's when Skype just became a new thing. And I thought it would be a very cool thing to um, uh, use Skype as a way of um, interacting one-on-one -on -one with people around the world. Mm -hmm. And it was right around this time that I was still um, using my advertising agency as my calling card. But I would find myself uh, more and more becoming um, – um, shall we say, uh, blown off by people at networking events when I introduced myself as an advertising guy because these were small business owners. Yep. And when they heard the, shall we say, the A word, um, mm -hmm. they kind of uh, excused themselves and got another drink. Um, they, um, you know, and for good reason, you know, when they think, when they thought of an ad agency, they thought of uh, TV commercials and expensive print ads that went in magazines that they could never afford to buy, nor did they really need to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I just realized pretty quickly in the late 90s that identifying myself as an ad agency guy, as award winning as I may have been, was still not a very good way to introduce myself. So I started calling myself a marketing expert, which um, would get a little bit more interest because uh, while business, small businesses may not need advertising, they all need marketing. Yeah. You know, marketing, as you know, is a much broader thing. It may not include paid media, but it does include everything else mm -hmm. um, in addition to that. But um, the marketing therapy thing, which is how I ended up branding my consulting in 2004, really was a very serendipitous uh, uh, thing that I, I didn't really expect to happen. I got a call, Deborah, from a woman out of the blue who said, um, John, I, I got your name from a friend of mine. He said, you're, you're an amazing, you're a brilliant marketing guy, advertising guy. I know you can help me. Um, I really need to talk to you. To which I replied, um, well, what do you do? And she was kind of a consultant herself. And at the time, again, I was still, uh, my mindset was I was an advertising guy. I, I will come up with a tagline for you. I will write copy for you. I will do a radio commercial or a billboard for you or an ad for you or a brochure. But I'm not going to uh, work with you on an hourly basis consulting. That's not what I do. I didn't think that was a very um, good business model to, you know, a time for money business model. I was working on retainer and on projects. I wasn't, you know, pay for play. I, you know, that's what cab drivers do. You know, they they turn the meter on and you, they pay for your time. Yeah. So um, I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't do that. And she said, well, no, 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 you don't understand. You have to help me. I really, and she just would not allow me to get off the phone. And Again, I asked her, I said, so how did you find out about me? She said, well, first, I was you were highly referred to me. Plus, um, I've seen your work around the city. I think you do great, great work. It's brilliant. Plus, I saw you give a presentation once, and you were amazing. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I made a point to do, Deborah, that I know you're a big uh, advocate of is public speaking. Mm -hmm. So every opportunity I would get, and I was, I, I was always, believe it or not, I was a very introverted person. Um, when I started out at my career, but I really knew I knew that I had to get over that. So, um, you know, I took I got involved in something called Toastmasters. I think that's an international company and yeah, really forced my yeah, forced myself. Yeah. I took a, a couple of acting. I took an acting class in New York, acting for non-actors in New York, <laughs> which was kind of fun. I think uh, I think Bob De Niro actually took courses at the same actor studio that I did. Um, awesome. <laughs> I didn't pursue it as far as he did, obviously, but um, it forced me to, you know, get myself feel comfortable out there. 
And so um, it served me well. And when she said that she um, uh, was very impressed with the presentation, it, it made me feel really good. So what I, I, I told her I would do was um, I, I, I knew that I, if I, I, the, way, the way I looked at it, Deborah, was let me give her an hourly rate that she probably can't afford. <laughs> but I don't really care, you know, because I don't really think this is a good business model anyway. So I'll just come up with a number just to get her off my back. And, and that'll be the end of it. So I, I, I told her I would think of it. I had to think about it because I had really no idea what my hourly time was worth. Yeah. Was worth. And this was back in 2004, and I decided two, $250. Do you have dollars in, in New Zealand? Yeah, we're, we're dollars in New Zealand as well, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I thought that's what I was worth. And uh, I didn't assume that she could afford it, but I, 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 um, that's what I told her what I was worth. And she, she paused for about three seconds, and she said, um, okay. And I said, oh, and I get paid up front also. And she said, um, okay. <laughs> and she came to my Park Avenue apartment and sat on my couch. And for the next 50 minutes, she, she started talking nonstop. And I was sitting next to her with my yellow legal pad and pen, taking notes as she was talking, occasionally asking questions. And um, I felt like a freaking therapist. <laughs> And as you know, I don't have to tell your listeners, if you're running your own business, it's a very personal experience, right? It, it is your business. You know, this is why I said earlier, when you said a you know, personal thing, when you are running your own business, it becomes a personal thing. Yeah. So I, I, I could appreciate uh, why for her, it was a very emotional uh, issue and, um, I had to interrupt her because our hour was coming up and I, I did, I wanted to feel like she was getting uh, her money's worth. And I said, listen, we only have 10 minutes left. I'll give you an extra 15 minutes. I don't mind doing that, but let me talk a little bit so I could give you my feedback, which I, I, I gave her and she was happy with it. But she said, you know, I feel like we're just getting started. At which point I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, well, I think we have to meet again. So I said, okay. Well, and we scheduled another appointment when she was in the elevator going down from my uh, 12, 12 floor apartment in, in New York. I started thinking, I wonder if I could create a business model around this. What, you know, this is an interesting because this woman clearly is desperate to work with me. And I, I, if I could find a dozen people who are willing to pay me $250 up front, yep. um, and, and basically, all I have to do is sit next to them and, and give them my, my, my feedback. Um, I, I could do that. In addition to, you know, whatever else I was doing with my other, you know, retainer and project based clients. So that's when I started thinking, well, how do I brand this? And it didn't take me a lot of um, uh, brain power to come up with marketing therapy, because like I said, it, I, I felt like I immediately felt like a therapist and it was kind of like therapy. And at least when I was at networking events and people said, well, what do you do? I wouldn't have to say, well, I'm a marketing consultant <laughs> or an advertising guy. I just see a glazed look on their face. I could say, well, I'm a mark. I do marketing therapy, therapy. Yeah. which really got usually got a response. What the hell is that? And they would usually say, excuse me, did you say marketing therapy? And that would begin a conversation, which is ultimately what you want to do at any networking event is engage people in, in a way that wants them, to, uh, begs them to want to learn more about you. That's that's it. Which is also the premise of advertising, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, a lot of the, the, the advertising skills, you've got to get their attention, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's uh, you're at a networking event or doing a TV commercial or doing a print ad, you immediately have to stop them. If they're going through a magazine or reading a newspaper, you've got to stop them, grab their attention. If they're watching TV, in the first five seconds, you've got to get their attention because if you don't have their attention in the first five seconds, they're not going to spend the next 25 seconds or uh, 55 seconds uh, watching your commercial. And, um, you know, I, TikTok is the new shiny object, but 
basically the, the thinking behind TikTok is the same thinking that I was doing 35 years ago when I was coming up with ideas for 30 second commercials. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so you've done a lot of these marketing therapy sessions uh, with, you know, small, medium sized business owners. What's been the biggest thing that keeps raising its head as the issue that uh, business owners have? Well, the biggest issue is that um, business owners, um, as, as much as they may be experts at their business, are definitely not experts at marketing their business. Mm -hmm. Even though many of them think they are, they're not. Yeah. And a big reason for that is it's not a disparagement on them. First of all, they, they didn't go to... Um, uh, university, you know, marketing, believe it or not, for many of, of your listeners, it's actually a thing you study at university. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not something you do just by watching a few um, uh, YouTube videos or listening to a few podcasts. All of a sudden, you're a marketing expert, although many people think that that's all they have to do. And God bless them if, if they want to go for it, you know. Sure. Um, but um, they're not experts at it. And, and the other thing, which is uh, an equal or bigger issue, Deborah, is that they don't have the necessary objectivity mm -hmm. that you really need to have to be successful at marketing their business. I can't tell you how many business owners I would start working with because they had a specific problem they, that they thought was their biggest issue. And I would talk to them for 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, realize that that is the least of their problem that they should be focusing on. You know, they, they, they just don't see it. They don't have the objectivity. One guy um, was referred to me because I was uh, introduced to him as someone who did great TV commercials and he wanted a TV commercial. <clears throat> he didn't know I had this marketing therapy business model. Uh, this was early when I early um, into what, while I was doing it, maybe 2004 or five. And so he was, I, I was starting to talk to him about his commercial or the commercial that he said he needed and quickly realized uh, the guy didn't even have a website at the time. This was 2004. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mean to offend him or, or talk my way out of a, what could have been a pretty fun, lucrative project. I love doing TV stuff. So at the risk of losing that project, I, 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 I can't. I'm sorry. I, I just I'm just too honest with people. If if I'm talking to a business owner and um, they don't realize the the problem that they really should be focusing on, I can't help myself but tell them that in a way that's a, a, as tactfully as I as I can. Because like I said, a lot of these business owners think they know everything. They think what they they know their business, but they just don't have the ob objectivity. And he didn't realize that you can't be doing a TV commercial when you don't even have a freaking website. Yeah, where are they going to go to? Yeah. <laughs> so I, as tactfully as I, as I could, uh, suggested that maybe that would be something to focus on. Do your TV commercial um, after, after you do the website, but at least uh, have some, a place where people can go when you're doing your TV commercial, then you have the ability to reference your website where they could get more information, you know, in addition, in addition to the phone number or whatever else you're going to have, because I don't care how good the TV commercial is, it may not be enough to really um, convert them as a customer. And uh, if you have a really kick-ass website with some really good video content on there, that, that could help close the deal. And fortunately, he um, he was amenable to that and was actually very grateful. And that's where I introduced him to this marketing therapy, which he didn't realize that I had. And he ended up becoming one of my best customers. He started out working with me for, I don't know, just a few hours just to try it out and ended up, we ended up working together for about two years on an ongoing basis. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, nice. Okay, so we could probably talk about this stuff for ages because you've obviously got a wealth of experience there. But if we think about the listeners who are, you know, established business owners who maybe feel like they've hit the ceiling a wee bit, what would be the three top tips that you would give them around their marketing or just in business in general? Um, well, I know people are looking for simple answers and I, I'm hesitating because um, – 
every business is different. Every business owner is different. They've got u- their own unique personality. They've got, hopefully, they've got their own unique or special product or service. So um, I'm really, I really fight against these cookie cutter solutions. I'm not a big um, um, cookie cutter solution guy. Um, I, I would, I would say. Um, if you're not working with a, a really um, expert marketing person, someone you can trust, um, find someone that you could trust to work with because you really uh, should not be doing it yourself. And if you're working with someone who really knows what they're doing, um, you're not going to be hitting your ceiling. They're going to you're, they're going to help you with all the issues you might be struggling with from a marketing standpoint because they're experts at what they do. Yeah. And 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 uh, you know part of the problem, Deborah, is that some of these people who pitch themselves as marketing ex- experts really are not marketing experts. They're really um, uh, salespeople, really expert salespeople, mm-hmm. and they're really not the kind of people that can help. Um, small business owners um, with their unique marketing issues because every every issue, um, although they may be similar, they're they're not going to be exactly the same, and so it, it really takes someone who can um, listen to begin with, not immediately start talking and giving them answers because it starts with listening, um, which a lot of marketing people because they're more salespeople than they are marketing people are not very good at listening. They'll, they'll blah, 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 about all the things you should do without really listening to their, their, their client and understanding uh, the, the um, specific issues, the nuances, of, of, and, and really um, finding out what, what the focus really should be. So uh, that's what I would – and so I, I really feel for these uh, small business owners who might realize that they, they shouldn't be doing it, couldn't be doing it. They just don't know who to trust. And one of the articles I do a lot of writing, and one of the articles I wrote as a result of that was, um, I think it was uh, the seven key things to help you find qualified marketing help. Okay. There were there were seven of them, and if you want after this this podcast, I can email it to you in case you want to post it. But I will definitely. Uh, I, I think that would help yep. uh, because it's it's very difficult. Uh, you know, I, I could just say a couple of them. You could you know talk to your friends certainly. Uh, Referrals are good. So if you know people that have worked with a marketing resource that has uh, uh, worked out well for them, that's certainly one one thing that that's good. But just because they helped your friend doesn't necessarily mean they're right for you either. But that's that's one of the things. And there's there's a bunch more. Their credentials. Look at their credentials and look at their test. Uh, te- uh, you know, have have they gotten testimonials? You know. Um, things like that, success stories, case studies, things like that. But I, I could send you that if you want. I think that'd be really helpful. And I, yeah. I'm absolutely on your side. I don't think there is a cookie cutter approach to this. And I'm actually, a, I am a trained marketer myself, believe it or not. That was my first career training, um, well, biochemistry first, then marketing. Um, and I, I, it's true, it is a science. It is not uh, a science and art combined. Right. And it is something that you actually have to spend, you know, sharpening your saw, getting better and better at it. And so it's not something that anybody should really try on their own. I've got an advertising agency I work with. I've got a marketing agency I work with. I've got a couple of different people who actually help me with that because that's what they're doing day in day out and I would never dream of you know reading a book listening to a podcast about brain surgery and trying to do brain surgery and I think the, right. yeah there's the same I mean, you know, to your the, the other thing that a lot of people overlook and I have to say it here Deborah is um, they don't value talent hmm. you know what I'm saying they look at marketing and they listen to a lot of the sales person sir, sales people and it's all about analytics and systems and all this analytical stuff and they forget may, what may be, I think, the most important ingredient, and that's creative talent. Our agency um, was super, super, super successful, not because we had the clients that had the biggest budgets. Mm-hmm. They had very small advertising and marketing budgets. But the work we did was breakthrough creatively. It was really smart. It was strategically smart. It was on point. It got people's attention. It communicated the message. And it, it got the results for these small clients that they needed uh, because 
it, it was it was uh, it, it involved uh, creative talent, and that was that was my strength. My business partner was uh, uh, good at the business side, so he helped do the media buys and things like that. But that's another reason that business owners shouldn't be doing it because again. It, it takes knowledge, but like you said, it's comp the scientific part is more the knowledge side. The artistic side is more the creative talent side, and it takes both of those those elements. Mm. And it's, it comes down to you know that that sort of that big idea, that attention grabbing thing, that sort of no. But you can't even get to that point unless you actually know who your audience is, who what sort of pain point you're trying to solve for them, um, and that is, is that that's the work that a good agency or marketing agency does is to actually work through with you on that to help you uncover that. They do so, both, yeah. yeah. And an agency, uh, that's you know that's why companies go to agencies. That's why Steve Jobs, uh, in in 1976, when he just founded Apple. Uh, was had had the forethought, uh, even though he was just 21 years old, start opening his doors with Apple. Realized that over the long term, if he was going to be successful, he really need, needed to work with an advertising marketing guy. And uh, everyone thinks that Steve Jobs is the marketing genius behind Apple, but at, when he was 21, he certainly was not. He hired a guy named Regis McKenna, who was an advertising guy. And did marketing consulting on the side and worked with Regis for the first five or six years um, and, and that basically did all the groundwork and branding for Apple and helped Apple become the, the worldwide brand it is now. They did the logo for Apple and did all the, the, the things that uh, people don't realize that they assume that Steve Jobs did all this stuff. So, you know, this is why... Um, People need to look at marketing, and I'm, I know you know this, uh, not as an expense, but as an investment. Yeah. That's what it is. It's you're yeah. investing in yourself, you're investing in your business, and like any good investment, um, it's it's not just spending them. It's money that's going to come back to you. You know, hopefully two, threefold. And, and it increases the value of business. I was talking to a client actually just, just before this podcast and, you know, they were talking about their practice and their practices is there's nothing particularly unique or special about it. What they have done is they've built a really, really good brand around what they're doing. They um, And that then has value for when it comes time to sell or for when you want to uh, even borrow money from a bank, you know, being able to show that asset that you have, which is building that brand value. So you're absolutely right. It's definitely an investment and you should be looking for a return on investment investment in that as well. And a lot of, you know, you touched on something that's also important when you said brand. <clears throat> a lot of these smaller business owners, when they think of brand, they think of Coke and Pepsi and Pizza Hut and Apple and all that yeah. stuff. They say, well, I'm just a small company. You know, I, I'm not, I, I don't have the, the millions and millions of dollars to like Coke and Pepsi and McDonald's to do a brand. Well, you know, I, I built a brand being a marketing therapist. That was a brand, you know. I designed a logo with a with a therapist couch, and and put up content on you know the played off the whole idea of therapy and really worked up, really had fun with the idea of marketing therapy. So the point is that you don't uh, need to have um, millions of or thousands, even thousands of dollars, to begin thinking like a big company and start thinking about what your brand is. Mm -hmm. And of course, brand is way more than your logo. It's the entire um, delivery to the customer. But even so, even if we just look at something as simple as a logo, I, I, I cringe sometimes when I see people's logos because, you know, I know they've done that on Word or Canva or whatever it is. And it's like, that's the first thing the person's going to see of, of your your brand experience, which is much, much deeper than that. But it's the first thing they see. It's like when you go into a doctor's um, surgery and the reception is the first person you see. And so it's like, wow, why would you not invest in, in making sure that's the best possible representation of you up front and then deliver on the follow through? You know? uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, I, I, I experienced just what you said. And, you know, telling them their logo is not good is a little bit like telling them when they show you their baby pictures that their kid is ugly. It's ugly, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's really uh, it's a it's a dicey area to like um, to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, so I it prompted me to do to do something because it's very difficult to to basically tell tell someone they should change their logo. So a few years ago figuring out what, how do I deal with this issue, I came up with the idea of a logo facelift. Oh, yeah. Tell me more. 
So, um, and on my, if you go to my website, you can see a link that talks about that. But that was a way of kind of confronting this very important issue with basically uh, not telling them that their baby is ugly, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. and basically say, well, I think it just needs to be updated a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not it's a little bit that, of work. <laughs> it needs, yeah. It, yeah. It just, it needs to be a little refreshing. <laughs> yeah, love it. So let me tell you about my logo facelift program. And you say, oh, well, what is that? So they, at least they would be open to that, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, look, you've given us a, a huge amount of information here. And obviously if we, if you go to this site, you've got, we're going to, you can see the logo facelift, you can see the marketing therapist stuff. Um, you're going to find the link from for the seven key things to find a trusted sort of marketing professional. Um, just in terms of if somebody does want to get in contact with you, what is the website they should go to? How should they contact you, John? Yeah. It's, it's my last name followed by Inc. I-N-C. My last name is Follis and that's spelled F- as in Frank, O-L-L-I-S, Inc., I-N-C, fallisinc.com. Very simple. Lovely. And they can make contact through uh, that website with you too. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Hey, look, it's been it's been fascinating. Um, it's really <laughs> just a little sideline. Um, I actually owned an apartment in Parnell just down the road here in Auckland, and it was called the Syracuse Apartments. Um, and that was uh, – so hearing you talk about the real Syracuse was actually kind of quite interesting for me. But thank you for your time today. Thank you for all the amazing information that you've given us. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge. I know that you do this with no other intention now than helping people. So I appreciate you spending the time with myself and the listeners to come and do that. It's my pleasure, Deborah. Thanks so much for having me on your show.